We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Happy to see everyone gathered together this morning. We're in our second week of our great expectations. We're, we're talking about those expectations, those feelings of eagerness and hopefulness that we experience during the Christmas season. I'm glad you all are here for the second week. Uh, as we get started, before we get started, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I would love a chance to meet you. Uh, maybe we can meet outside in the lobby at some point uh, between services. I'd love to do that. Hey, I was uh, on, on the internet uh, this week, and I found this, this uh, article was, uh, the, called The Bible in 50 Words. I thought it was kind of interesting, so I wanted to share it with you. If you were to take the Bible and try to summarize it into 50 words, this is what the author of the article had done, and these were the 50 words. God made, man sinned, Noah arced, Abraham split, Jacob fooled, Joseph ruled, Bush talked, Moses balked, Pharaoh plagued, people wandered, sea divided, tablet guided, promise landed, Saul freaked, David peaked, prophets warned, Jesus born, God walked, love talked, anger crucified, hope died, but love rose, spirit flamed, word spread, God remained. And I heard that, and I, I, loved, I loved how it, it, it ended with this phrase, but make sure you read the unabridged version. <laughs> make sure you read the unabridged version. And when I saw that, one of the things I noticed in that was that one of the themes you're going to notice as you read Scripture, even as you look at a short list with just 50 words, is that it's filled with ordinary people. Ordinary people. Let's, uh, let's get on the same page this morning before we even start. Would you just do me a favor and raise your hand if you're an ordinary person? All right, and if your neighbor doesn't have their hand up, would you just remind them for a moment? We're all just ordinary people. And in this, this list... Of, of, of the Bible in 50 words. It's filled with the names of ordinary people. You go through scripture and you're gonna see ordinary people from cover to cover of this book. You think of people like Moses, right? Moses, he's got a, a speech impediment and God says, no, Moses, I want you to be the one who goes to communicate to Pharaoh and lead my people out of Egypt. You have people like Gideon who, who struggle with some trust issues, right? But God says, but I want you, Gideon, to lead my army. You have people like Elijah, right, who, who we see examples of him struggling with some depression. And yet God says, no, I want to use you to convict a nation of their sin. What about the story of David? Most of us know of David, right? David uh, struggles with lust and, and adultery and murder, and yet God says, David, I'm going to use you. I'm going to, God actually calls David a man after his own heart and uses David to, to be one of the most powerful kings that have ever ruled his people. What about Hosea? Got a rocky marriage, and yet he's used to be a prophet. You have Peter. And Peter and I, I, if, if, I don't know about you, but if I had to pick a character in Scripture where I'm like, man, this guy and I would probably be a lot alike. Peter, I think, is the guy that I, I connect with. Peter's the one who, who jumps out of the boat, you know, who, who just kind of jumps without thinking. He's always the one who's just kind of like just short-tempered, you know, and a promise breaker and just an imperfect, ordinary dude. But God used him to be the rock on which he built his church. What about Paul? I mean, Paul, he wrote a, just a ton of the books in your New Testament, of those letters. Paul, right, he persecuted Christians. He, he was uh, orchestrated their, their killing 
And yet God took him and changed him and took this ordinary broken guy and did incre- one of the most uh, the, like examples of an incredible missionary you have in Paul. See, all throughout scripture, you have example after example of God taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things through them. And that's also not lost on the Christmas story. You think about the story of Christmas, right? You have Zechariah and Elizabeth. You have Mary and Joseph, right? You have these shepherds. Like, why in the world did God choose shepherds to be the first people that he told about the birth of Jesus? It's ordinary people. You think of Simeon and Anna. Like, you go through the Christmas story, you have a lot of ordinary people. Ordinary people, even... (laughs) I mean, speaking of ordinary people, what about just ordinary place? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Remember when Micah said, oh, this little town that's not much, but God's going to do something really powerful through you. You see, God uses ordinary people to accomplish his redemptive purposes on earth. That is the big aha moment of my message today. I want everyone to know right here that God uses ordinary people to accomplish his redemptive purposes on earth. So one more time, raise your hand if you're an ordinary person, all right? So what I'm wanting to make sure that we all walk out of the door with kind of a similar frame of mind, that God uses people like you and like me to accomplish his redemptive purposes on this earth. In other words, God can take ordinary people and turn you into something pretty extraordinary through him. And that's what I want to look at as as we look at this uh, this season of expecting. Last week we talked about an expectant world, right? Throughout the Old Testament we see God's people expecting a Messiah. Well today I want to look at an expectant mother. We're going to look at the story of Mary and her part in the Christmas account. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, all right? And we're going to look at how Mary was an expectant mother. If you think about Mary, if you think about uh, a nativity scene, how many of you, when you decorate, part of your decoration is a nativity scene at some point, right? Somewhere in your house, you get all the characters of a nativity scene. And you've probably noticed that some people, you have multiple nativity scenes. They're set up in different places in your home. Some of them have all the characters, right? Some of them, you got animals and multiple shepherds, and you got the, the wise men and all the characters, right? And, and, and if you were to have a very limited space, and you were to try to set up a nativity scene, and you only had like one little, uh, like a six inch by six inch little square to set up your nativity scene, well, you would have to figure out what parts of the nativity story aren't going to be included in that, right? Because not everything's going to fit. So as you're making that decision and you pick uh, just the characters that you know have to be in the, the basic nativity scene, can we all agree that Jesus makes the cut? Can we? All right, Jesus, Jesus makes the cut, right? Jesus is really the only, if you only had one space for one, Jesus gets it, right? But if you had room for two more, well, Mary and Joseph, these are like the three main characters of the whole nativity story, the Christmas account. You know that, that Mary and, and Joseph and this baby Jesus, if, if all, in fact, I've seen a lot of nativity scenes that it's just those three characters. In fact, if you really look at the whole account, it probably was maybe just those three at the beginning. But Mary is an incredible character and part of the nativity story. I'm reminded of a, a story, an account of a boy And this boy, in his family tradition, instead of writing a letter to the big guy in red telling uh, Santa what he wants for Christmas, instead he would write a letter to, to Jesus every year. So he got out a piece of paper and he started writing, Dear Jesus, here is a list of the things I would love for Christmas. I have been a very good boy. I haven't done anything wrong in the last month. And he looks down at this paper and he thinks... Like, ah, oh, no, no, it's, Jesus is too smart for that. So he, he folds it up and he throws it out and he gets out a new piece of paper. Dear Jesus, here are the things I would love for Christmas. I've been a very good boy. I haven't done anything wrong for the past week. And he thinks, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Crumbles it up, throws it out. Dear Jesus, I've been a very good boy. I haven't done anything wrong for the past day. 
And he thinks about it. Oh, no. And he scratches off day and he writes hour. And he's like, oh, no. He crumbles that up and he walks over to the family nativity scene. And mom's watching him, but she doesn't really see what he does. He goes over and he grabs something out of the box, out of the nativity scene. He puts it in his shoebox and puts it up in his closet. And he gets out a new piece of paper. Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again... That's a, that's a bad dude. But I think we can all agree that as we're talking about this expectant mother, that Mary was an extraordinary part of the Christmas account. But at the end of the day, as we're looking at how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things through them, to, be, to fulfill his redemptive purposes on earth, at the end of the day, I wanted to tell you and share with you four things about Mary that I hope all of us can know about Mary, but not just to, so that we can know this about Mary. I want us to know these things so we can actually apply them to our own lives. These are things that, lessons that we can learn from Mary in the Christmas account. Here's the first thing, and this is going to rub some people the wrong way right off the bat, is this one right here. Mary was ordinary. Raise your hand again if you're an ordinary person. All right. Some of you maybe have been raised within a faith system that would say or teach you that Mary was something other than ordinary. And, and there's a, you know, systems of faith that would teach that Mary was sinless and that there had never been a point in her life where she had made a mistake. Well, I want you to know that that tradition doesn't come from this book at all. Mary was as broken and, and regular and ordinary as every single one of us in this room. Mary was ordinary. In Luke 1, starting in verse 26, it says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Hey, before we keep reading, I want to ask you to do me a favor. I want you to look at this account as we're introduced to the person of Mary, I want you to throw out any sort of preconceived ideas you have. Pretend you've never heard about Mary before. This is your first time exploring the Christmas narrative, okay? And, and, and this is the first time in Scripture her name comes up. So we're, we're being introduced to this virgin named Mary. Before we even get to, to Mary, it, notice it says that the, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth... All right, I want to explain to you that Nazareth, he even goes out of his way, or Luke says, a village in Galilee. Because Nazareth, Nazareth was nothing special. If, if you are live in this area, let's say, uh, how many of you live in Glen Burnie? I live in Glen Burnie. How many, so Glen Burnieites, is that how you say it? Glen Burnians? Whatever. All right, so if you live in Glen Burnie, and you have someone in your family who lives in, uh, on the West Coast, and they ask you, where do you live? right? You probably don't say Glen Burnie, right? Because people are like, I don't know. And maybe you say Glen Burnie, but then you're going to put the comma, a city, a town in you know, near Baltimore or in Maryland, or you're going to give some other context because nobody knows where Glen Burnie is unless they live in this general area, right? It's just, so Nazareth is nothing special. Luke has to go out of his way to say Nazareth, you know, in Galilee, it give you a little bit of context. No, no, not a special place. She's not from anywhere special. And then it explains that she's just a virgin who's engaged, named Mary, who's engaged to a man named Joseph. These are common names. This is a pretty common situation. Mary was likely somewhere between the ages of 14 and 18 at this moment, probably between 15 and 17 years old. This is a pretty typical time frame for marriage in this, this day. This isn't an extraordinary situation. This is a normal girl who is in a very exciting part of her life and she's engaged to be married. I don't know about you, but engagement was a really exciting part of my life. Especially, uh, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the groom, right? You're right? When, uh, in the engagement phase, I can imagine that for the bride, engagement must have been a really exciting phase of her life. 
I was so excited before I was even engaged. I couldn't wait. Remember the first time, those of you who are married or have been engaged before, the first time you were able to use the word fiance? Remember how special that was? You heard someone else say fiance and you're like, ooh, that sounds nice, right? I couldn't wait. I was so in love with my, my, my but at the time, like my girlfriend, I wanted my wife to become my fiance. I went all out. I planned this elaborate proposal. I could go into detail, but it would take too long. There were sparkling lights and recorded music and a spotlight and all sorts of people helping me hidden in the woods. And also, it was a pretty big deal because I was excited about this moment of, of Melissa becoming my fiance. I, I designed her, her, her engagement ring. I had one of my mom's friends was a jeweler. And she went to San Francisco with me. We met with a jeweler and we drew it out and he helped me create it. And it was awesome. I was excited about becoming a fiance. And I can imagine that in that moment when Melissa said yes and we were now engaged to be married, that next season of our life leading up to a wedding, those are exciting moments of your life as you're putting together a wedding and planning and all that. We know weddings were a celebratory thing in scripture. So Mary is engaged, it's just an ordinary girl, engaged to an ordinary guy from an ordinary town. And her life is about to, to change drastically. Now here, I can imagine a lot of you are saying, but if you keep reading, Matt, it's gonna call Mary favored two times, right? When the angel comes to her, the angel says, Mary, oh, you favored one of God. I wanna make sure you understand that that doesn't mean that she's something other than ordinary, in fact, that word favored is actually the Greek word charis, which means grace. And what it really means is that you've been graced by God. Another way to look at that word favor is you're so ordinary that God is going to do you a favor and use you to do something extraordinary. That's what that word means. In other words, you don't deserve for 2,000 years later from now, as people are gathered in a church, it, there's nothing special enough about you specifically that your name deserves to be mentioned. But God is going to write you into his story and do something extraordinary through you that you don't deserve. That's what he's saying when he calls Mary favored. One who's going to be shown grace by God to do something incredible. I understand that Mary is far more than ordinary now. We look back at what God did through her and we're like, wow, what an extraordinary woman. What an extraordinary account. What an extraordinary amount of faith. But we have to recognize before that, as she's walking into this account where the angel is visiting her, she was ordinary. But that is about to change. Number two, is Mary was humble. Mary was humble. Let's keep reading in verse 28, and I'll show you what I mean by that. It says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. There's that first use of that word favored, right? So he says to her, Greetings to you, the one to whom God is going to show favor. Uh, the Lord is with you. And then it says that Mary's response was confused and disturbed. And Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Have you ever been in a situation before where you're in a large crowd and you see a ways away and someone, it seems they're looking right at you and they wave and you're thinking, I don't know you, right? Uh, do I wave back? And sometimes we, we awkwardly, we, we wave back and then we realize as they walk by us to someone else, we're like, oh, that was weird, <laughs> right? Well, what's happening here is Mary has this angel visit her and says, you favored one of God. And she goes, me? The Bible says that she's confused and disturbed as to, in her ordinariness, why God would choose to send an angel to talk to her, to give her a special task to do that we'll be talking about 2,000 years later. You see, she, there's a humbleness, a humility in her spirit where she recognizes that this is God showing an ordinary girl incredible favor. She knows that she is ordinary. Number three, is Mary was available. 
Mary was available. If we keep reading in verse 30, this is what the angel says. It says, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. That's the second time that word favor is used. It says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Don't miss what the angel has just said to Mary. If Mary before was just like, hey, oh, you favored one of God. If she's like, wait, who, me? Me? Seriously, me? Imagine how she must have been feeling after the angel gives her a little bit more context. Hey, by the way, you, Mary, you're gonna give birth to the son of the most high. And that son is gonna sit on the throne. He's gonna be a king in the line of David. Oh, and by the way, that throne will never end. He will be sitting on that throne forever. I don't know about you, but in that moment, Mary must have been like, who, me? And what she's about to do and what she's about to say in response to this is often misconstrued as a question of doubt. Oftentimes, we, as we keep reading, we, we think of this, this doubt. If we keep reading in verse 34, it says, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. When we read Mary's response, our initial gut, right, is to think, well, there she is doubting God. But let me explain to you why this isn't a question of doubt. Number one, just in context, if you just go back a few verses earlier, right? We already know exactly what happened to Zechariah when he asked a question that was filled with doubt. See, what Zechariah did when God sent an angel to him and said, you're going to give birth to a son, your barren wife of many years is going to give birth, his question was essentially a response of, yeah, right, you can't do that. And what was the response? The angel made it so that he couldn't speak until the fulfillment of that promise. He was punished, in a way, for his lack of faith, his lack of believing. But Mary, her response from the angel is different. So we understand that her question isn't a question of doubt. It's more of a question of availability. And let me explain what I mean by that. See, Mary is engaged to be married. By now, she's probably sat down, right, with her mom and dad, and she understands the birds and the bees. She understands how babies are made and where they come from. So she's answering this, this, this angel saying, well, I, I'm really confused because I know how this process works. And she goes out of her way to say, I'm a virgin. How can this be? And her question isn't, I don't believe that you're capable of doing this. She's saying, I don't understand how you're going to do this. But then she asks a question. Why do you ask a question of a how? It's because you want to know the answer. You want to be part of the answer. You want to understand how this is going to work. Mary makes herself available to the truth. See, I want to encourage you with kind of a side note here for just a moment. God is not afraid of your questions. If you've got a question about something going on in your life, there's, there's questions of doubt, right? There's a way to say, God, listen, I've lost my job and I don't think you're capable of fixing this mess. Now that's a question and a statement of doubt. But you can go to God with your questions and say, God, I've lost my job. I don't know. Can you help me figure out where I'm gonna feed, how I'm gonna feed my family? God, how long am I going to be waiting until I find the next job? How are you going to use this? These are questions that don't come from a place of doubt. They just come from a place of curiosity. God, I want to be available to be a part of the answer. I just don't understand what the answer is right now. And that's what Mary is saying. If I want to encourage you with a passage of Scripture in Philippians 4, verse 6. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. 
what this verse is really saying is, hey, whatever is going on in your life, no matter how bad you think things might be going, don't panic about it. Instead, just take those worries, take those concerns, take those doubts and those questions, package them up and give them to God, hand them over to him. Present those requests to God. And what Mary is doing right now is she's not doubting God's faithfulness. She's not doubting God's ability. She's not doubting whether or not God can do this. She's simply saying, how can this be? I know how this process works, and I'm a virgin. So whether or not you've lost a job, or you have a business that's failing, or you've been trying for many months or years now to get pregnant, or you're confused about your finances or your marriage is struggling, all those things, you're questioning your faith, all those, listen, those are great opportunities to go to God in, avail- in availability and say, God, I don't know how you're going to work through this. Will you show me? Ask him those questions. So that's what Mary does. She says, how is this going to work? And the angel replies in verse 35. It says, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. I don't know about you, but I think even after the angel answers Mary's question, she says, how is this going to happen? And the angel says, well, this is how it's going to happen. And he explains it to her. I'm sure that all that came from that was more questions. I still have more questions. She must have had a ton more questions. How about this question? Well, what is this community going to think when, they, when I start showing and I'm still engaged to be married? That must have been a question running through her mind. Or what is Joseph going to think when I tell him about this? Is he even going to believe me? Maybe she thought this. What is my dad going to think? Maybe she had some really practical questions about what it would be like as a mother to raise the son of God. I would have had some questions like, so do, does, does the son of God, like, does he burp? Do I got to like burp him or does he, is he immune from all that stuff? Do I got to change diapers here? Do, like, what's going to happen? Is, is he like never going to, is he just going to come out walking because it's the son of God? And she must have had some incredible questions. And yet, In in her availability, she went to God and said, how is this going to work? And the angel, through God speaks through this angel and explains, listen, this is how it's going to work. And it didn't, certainly didn't take away all the answers to these questions. But she was available. She said she was open to letting God figure it all out through her. And that leads us to number four, is that Mary was faithful We know that Mary was ordinary, Mary was humble, Mary was available, and now we see Mary the faithful. See, the angel goes on to remind Mary of a core truth that all of us need to remember in this room. And if you look at verse 37, here's what the angel says. He says, for the word of God will never fail. Here's a truth right now you can you can put all the money in the bank on this right here. You can count on this. In fact, say it with me. You ready? For the word of the Lord will never fail. If an angel of God comes and communicates truth to you about God, about something he's going to do, the word of God will never fail. The angel reminds Mary, listen, all these things I've just said to you, they're going to happen because the word of God never fails. If you're looking at the the New King James Version or the King James Version, you probably have something that sounds like this. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing is impossible for God. Now you might be thinking through this, Mary. You might be wondering how in the world has a baby come out of this situation as you're a virgin. I know it doesn't sound naturally possible, but supernaturally, God is capable of all things. Nothing is impossible for him. Now here's another important reminder for all of us in this room. Raise your hand again if you're ordinary. There's a whole lot of stuff for us that's impossible. There's a whole lot of things that you and I can never pull off. For God, all things are possible, but for you and I, ordinary people, a lot of things are impossible. In fact, I'll give you a really great 
probably the most powerful example of something that is impossible for you and impossible for me. You cannot save yourself. You cannot just do it good enough. You can't live life well enough. You can't just kind of get it all figured out and one day stand before God and say, God, I know you sent your son for me, but I got one better for you. I did it on my own. It's not gonna happen. You can't do it. It's impossible for you. You can't save yourself. All the way back to the garden, we see examples of us trying to save ourselves. I mean, think about that. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, right? They're there in the garden. The knowledge of good and evil has come and flooded into their minds. The hostility of that is already present. And what do they immediately try to do? They try to fix it. They grab some fig leaves and sew them together to cover up their uncomfortability, to try to make things right. That is like the human experience. All of us, we constantly try to fix what we can't fix. Jeremiah 13, 23 says it this way. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard take away its spots? Neither can you start doing good, for you have always done evil. And I know you're not going to want to raise your hand this time, but raise your hand if you're an ordinary person that this verse applies to. Like certainly, we can have moments where we do something that seems good, that sounds good, that looks good. We can try to do some things that make a difference. But at the end of the day, the Bible's really clear that it is impossible for us to do good all the time. It is impossible for us to earn our way into heaven, to save ourselves. But you see, with God, nothing is impossible. See, God can take ordinary, messed up, broken sinners like you and like me, and as uncomfortable as this might sound to you, like Mary, and use them to do incredible, extraordinary things, to be and fulfill the redemptive purposes of God's on earth. So as we think about that for a moment, this is how Mary responds. Remember we're saying that Mary was faithful. The angel has just told her that nothing will be impossible for God. And this is how Mary responds in verse 38. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. You see how much faithfulness is in that verse? One little verse, very beginning story, again, of of the Christmas account. The angel comes and tells Mary, you're gonna give birth to a son. He's gonna sit on David's throne forever. And she says, how is this gonna happen? I'm confused. And the angel explains it and then says, listen, and God's word will never fail. Nothing is impossible for God. In fact, Mary, I want you to know God uses ordinary people when they can humble themselves and make themselves available, he can take ordinary people and use them to do extraordinary things. But you've got to then step into that availability and faith and take the first step. And what Mary does is that right here. She says in verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. There it is again. Mary makes a bold statement of faith and says, I want to have open hands. I want to be used in an extraordinary way in my ordinariness. So as we ask the question of what now, God, uh, when we ask this this three-word prayer, I, I hope that you're sitting right now and that the Spirit's stirring inside of you and that you're asking your, your God this question right here. God, what do you want me to do with this? How can the life of Mary and her choices that she made, how can they affect me? How can I walk out of this building more like your son? And here's what I hope all of us can take away. Take all of those statements and put them together in one sentence. And we get this right here. God uses ordinary people. Raise your hand again. Ordinary people. Who know they are nothing apart from Christ. Already, we're gonna lose some people. Some people think, I'm pretty awesome apart from Christ. I think I got it on my own. I think I can figure this out. I don't need Christ. But God takes the ordinary people 
who know that they're broken and know that they're lost and know that they're in desperate need for a savior, that know that apart from Christ, there's, they're nothing. God takes those ordinary people that know that they are nothing apart from Christ when they allow God to work through them in faith. What I mean by this is that each of us ordinary people in this room, when we humble ourselves and recognize that we need Christ, that he's a, a crucial in our lives, and that we open up our hands in availability and say, God, I believe that you can do whatever you want through me. I don't have to understand. I'm going to have some questions. I'm not going to quite know how you're going to do it all, but I believe and make myself available in faith. God will take you and do extraordinary things through your life. A lot of times we get stuck in this trap where we think, we think of people like Mother Teresa, right? And we're thinking, oh, wow. Well, that's an example of an extraordinary person. God uses extraordinary people to do extraordinary things. We think of people like Billy Graham. We're like, oh, well, no, there's another example of an extraordinary man. And God used an extraordinary man to do extraordinary things. Sometimes we put other people on a pedestal. You might look up here and be like, no, God only uses pastors and missionaries and people like that to do extraordinary things for the kingdom of God. But I want you to know that all the people I just listed are ordinary people. And when we all of us together recognize our ordinariness and humble ourselves to recognize our desperate need for a savior and open our hands in availability and in faith, whatever God wants to do through us, he can do extraordinary things through your life. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the example we have in Mary. Thank you for taking an ordinary girl. Thank you for for showing us through Mary that you take ordinary people and with your favor and your grace, you give us an opportunity to be written into your story. You give us opportunities to be a part of the the redemption work that you're doing on this earth. You give us a part, an opportunity to be a part of the story that you're writing. And we, we don't deserve it, but we recognize right now in this room that we we humbly recognize in this room that we are desperately in need of your saving grace. That you show your favor to us a broken people. You give us something we don't deserve in salvation. And then you take us in our brokenness. And when we open up our hands and say, God, use me, do whatever you want through me. And then we take that first and that second and that third and that fourth step of faith and walk forward into whatever you're calling us into. You can take us ordinary people and do extraordinary things through us. God, I pray that this would be a church of extraordinary people through the work that you've done in their ordinariness. I love you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.